everyone and welcome to this lesson on Faraday's laws of electrolysis. Previously we've always looked at electrolysis in terms of predicting what might happen at the cathode and anode. What we're going to do now is add some calculations into um, the mix as well so we can actually predict how much of these things we might produce when we conduct electrolysis as well. So Faraday's laws are um, basically a way that we um, start to look at, um, as I said, predicting how much will produce be produced at a cathode or an anode. And in generally, in general, it's defined as the mass. What affects the mass of metal produced by electrolysis? So, what things can we do to a electrolytic cell that will either increase or decrease the mass of metal produced by electrolysis? So. Um, electrolysis, as we know, is using electricity to drive a redox reaction, which involves a transfer of electrons. So if we want to look at, um, I guess, manipulating this reaction, we need to think about what we can do to allow either more or less electrons to go onto a particular um, species and thus be reduced or oxidised at the cathode or anode. The mass of something produced at a cathode will be based around this equation here. So this equation here is to do with any random metal ion and being it's being reduced by adding electrons to it and forming metal solid. So if we are looking at this particular reaction, what is going to affect the mass of metal produced? Well, there's a couple of things which are, make sense. The amount of electrons, if we increase the number of electrons going through our electrolytic cell, that should increase our mass of metal produced. And that's a pretty common, that's, that's relatively common sense, but it's one of Faraday's first laws. The first law is applied to the electric charge, which is a measure of current and time. If you have a high current, which is flow of electricity, we have a large amount of electrons going through our um, cell, thus we're gonna get a lot of metal. If we let the electrolytic cell go for a long time, again, you're going to produce lots and lots and lots of electrons. So that, therefore, you're going to end up with more metal produced. So Faraday's first law is about how mass is related to the charge, which is a measure of current and time. And over here, we're going to end up looking at the equation which deals with that. So that's the first law. Mass, more current, more time, more mass produced, Faraday's first law. The second law is around the charge on our metal ion. So as this example here, this is a one positive ion. So therefore you need one electron to make it a metal. If this was a two positive ion, you'd actually need two electrons to make a metal. So therefore you're gonna halve the number of mole of, of metal you're gonna produce if it's a doubly charged ion. So therefore, the mass is related to the type of ion used, and that's gonna be related to the charge on the ion and also the molar mass of the um, metal that you're going to be using. So therefore, they're the two things that are going to affect the mass of metal produced. Firstly, the current and, sorry, the, the current and time, which is the charge, electrical charge, and secondly, the type of ion that's going to be used to create your metal. So the next thing that's going to pop up are all our equations we're going to deal with. And here they are. As I said, this is um, where we can calculate um, the charge. Q here represents the charge in a unit called coulombs. And that is a measure of the current and the time in seconds. This time should be a little t, my bad. Um, so the charge in coulombs is measured by current times time and the times in seconds. Our coulombs here, our charge, is we can use that to work out the number of electrons um, being produced. So this F here, Faraday's constant, is 96,500. And what that is, is the charge, the electrical charge on one mole of electrons. So therefore we have a way of converting our charge into number of moles of electrons. There's gonna be an example of how to do all this type of stuff in the next slide. The ratio of number of moles to, um, of electrons to the mass is very important. So being able to 
ratio properly is good. And then obviously finding the mass um, using number of moles times molar mass is going to be important as well. So these are our equations. We're going to need to, well, here, these two really are new ones to you. All right. And that we're going to start to look at in a bit more detail. All right. So the next question, next slide is a question um, which is going to explain how we might use these in an actual um, exam style question. So here's our example question. Our example question is this. When 1.2 amps of current was applied to a solution of copper 2 sulfate for two hours, the inert cathode was found to increase in mass. So here's our lovely little diagram. These, um, these electrodes here are inert, so they're not going to react. And what we found here was that the cathode was found to increase in mass. The actual questions are over here. And we have the first one, which is write the half equation for the reaction occurring at the cathode. Then determine the mass change at the cathode. And then what would you expect to see happen at the anode? And how would you test for this? So let's start to look at answering these questions. First one is very similar to what we've done beforehand, which is looking at predicting the products. Uh, all we need to do for this is look at our electrochemical series, highlight all the things that we have, and then work out what's our strongest oxidant and strongest reductant. Looking at this, we have got copper 2 positive, we have got water, which is here, and water up here as well. Our strongest oxidant is our copper, and that's going to re react at the cathode. So our Half equation for the reaction occurring at the cathode will be simply copper 2 plus 2 electrons forming copper solid. So therefore, that's answer to question 1. Done. Give it a tick. Ooh. Next question is determine the mass change at the cathode. And now here's where we need to start to apply Faraday's laws. So what do we know from our question? We know that we have the amps and we have the time. Right. So what that tells me is I can get Q equals IT. And that's going to give me my electrical charge. So that's done down here, where our electrical charge Q equals amps times um, the time. And we have our amps being 1.2 amps and our time being 2 hours. We need to convert that into seconds. So it's 2 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And that gives us our electrical charge, which is 4,320 coulombs in this particular cell. That's how much electricity is being pumped through this cell. So once we have that, what do I need to now do? I need to try and convert this charge into a mass of copper. To do that, I'll use my um, second equation, which is to do with charge being equal to number of moles of electrons times Faraday's constant, which is the charge on one mole of electrons. So if I look at that, I can rearrange that to work out what the number of moles of electrons are. And that's going to look like this, where the number of moles of electrons equals my electrical charge divided by Faraday. So therefore, um, I have the charge divided by the charge on one mole of electrons, which is one Faraday which is 96,500, and I get my number of moles of electrons here. That's my number of moles of electrons that is flowing through this particular cell over here. So now I have my number of moles of electrons. I can use the ratio that I know from my equation to work out how much copper there is. And I know copper is a two positive ion, so therefore my ratio is two electrons gives me one copper. So therefore, looking at that, I take my electrons, divide by two, I get how much copper I should be forming on the cathode. So therefore, there's my number of moles of copper. I'll then take that number of moles of copper, times it by my molar mass, and I get how much the cathode should have increased by. So that is my mass change of my cathode because at my cathode, I'm forming copper solid. Hopefully that makes sense. Where we're looking at from our information, we find our electrical charge. We use that to find our number of moles. We use a ratio from our equation to work out the number of moles of the thing that was produced. 
and then I can convert that into grams because that's what my question asked me. I wanted to know what the mass change was. So there's question two done, and that's using Faraday's laws, um, particularly the, um, well, actually both of them. It's using both the, um, the first law here, which was that charge is related to um, the current and time, or the amount of stuff is produced is related to current and time, which is electric charge. And it's also the second one where the amount of stuff produced is related to the um, ratio of electrons to to um, the, the mass produced. Next up, um, let's look at question three. What would you expect to see happen at the anode and how would I test for this? Well, the first part of it should be pretty straightforward. I look for my strongest reductant, which is the lowest on my right here, which is water. And that should be producing oxygen and hydrogen ions. So therefore I'm gonna produce O2 and hydrogen ions. Now, how am I going to test for this? This is something you might not know, and this is where gen general chemistry kind of comes into it. I can test for hydrogen ions, pretty obviously. I can just look for a pH change, and that's gonna be using a suitable indicator. So a suitable pH indicator would tell me if I'm producing hydrogen ions or not. How would I test for oxygen gas? Well, testing for oxygen gas is using a wooden splint that is glowing, so glowing red, and if it reignites, that tells me there's a lot of oxygen present. So definitely, hot oxygen gas is tested by using a glowing splint, and hydrogen ions is tested with a pH indicator. So hopefully that makes sense to you um, in answering this question. Basically, the only new, I guess, part, the part that's really related to this video, is question two here, determining the mass change. And that's where we start to apply these two equations to the information that's presented to us in the question. And each time I'm doing a calculation question, I'd always write these equations down and then start to use them. That's kind of how my brain works. I like to see an equation and then start to attack the question. So in to recap this, basically what, what's important here is that Faraday's laws of electrolysis are all about what affects the mass of metal produced by electrolysis. I'm going to do another video on practical applications and how we can test this, um, because those type of questions are really good for extended response questions as well. So, and I guess more about scientific method. Um, so I'm gonna do another video on that. What this was all about was basically introducing you to these equations here and making sure that you could utilize those in terms of calculating how much stuff will be produced through electrolysis. Um, remember that this is about finding electrical charge using your amps and your time. Um, and this one here is relating that electrical charge to your number of moles of electrons. And remember that the Faraday here, Faraday's constant, what I'm really referring to here as F, is 96,500. And what that is, is the charge on one mole of electrons. So therefore, obviously, if we have two moles of electrons, we'll have two Faraday's worth of charge, which would be two times this number, which is where we actually get this equation from. So it's nice to think about where equations come from. As I said, I'll be talking about these two particular Faraday's laws and how we can test those in a practical sense in my next video. So thanks for watching and start looking at some calculation questions to do with electrolysis.